Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, a consultant in clinical neurophysiology. In this video, I'm going to explain a number of conditions which cause myositis, which means inflammation of the muscles. There are a number of different types, and in this video, I will concentrate on three of them. Polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and necrotizing myositis. These three causes of myositis are uncommon, and usually affect around six people in 100,000. These are caused by the immune system turning on the body's muscle tissue, usually for reasons unknown in what's called an autoimmune disease process. However, sometimes it can also be related to underlying cancers, which I'll come back to later. They all cause muscular weakness and fatigue, but because they have different underlying mechanisms, they present differently. So I'll describe them individually before addressing their treatment, which tends to be similar. Polymyositis literally means inflammation of many muscles. It causes symmetrical weakness over weeks or months in the proximal muscles of the shoulders, hips, and the muscles in the neck, which pull the head down. Apart from the muscle shrinkage, weakness, and fatigue, many patients also experience pain in the muscles called myalgia. The type of inflammatory cells involved are those which attack cells directly, such as macrophages and CD8 positive T cells. These can be detected on muscle biopsy and, where present, are seen to surround or invade healthier muscle tissues. Dermatomyositis means inflammation of both skin and muscles. In addition to the weakness of the proximal muscles, this condition has characteristic effects on the skin. These can include the following features. Increased blood vessel changes around the nail beds called periungual hyperemia. Purplish nodules on the back of the hands, known as Gottron's papules. Enlarged and cracked hands, called mechanics hands. V-shaped reddish rashes on the front of the chest, or across the back of the chest in a shawl distribution. Purplish rashes around the eyes, called a heliotrope rash. Swelling around the eyelids, called periorbital edema and sometimes hard white calcifications can deposit under the skin too, often on the knees and elbows. The presence of certain types of skin features can be used to predict how aggressive the condition might become. For example, mechanics hands are associated with higher rates of associated lung inflammation, and the presence of calcifications are associated with muscle pain. This condition can also very rarely occur in children and is called juvenile dermatomyositis occurring in around three children per million. In dermatomyositis, the types of inflammatory cells are different to polymyositis and include CD4 positive T cells and B cells. Interestingly, the immune response also causes a reduction of blood supply to muscle fibers and so causes portions of the muscle to shrink down to in a process called perifascicular atrophy. Biopsy of the muscles and skin tissues can reveal characteristic changes. A small percentage of dermatomyositis can occur with little overt clinical involvement of the skin, but with positive changes existing on skin biopsy. This is called adermatopathic dermatomyositis. Similarly, it can also exist as clinically obvious skin changes, but without clinically obvious or minimal myopathy, though with some positive changes on muscle biopsy. This is called CADM, which stands for Clinically Amyopathic Dermatomyositis. The third type of myositis I'll talk about is necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, which has a similar clinical presentation to polymyositis with a similar pattern of muscle weakness, and muscle pain is also very common. It tends to occur in older adults and is often associated with specific autoantibodies, such as anti-SRP and anti-HMG-CoA antibodies. Two-thirds of patients with anti-HMG-CoA antibody-related myositis have previously taken statin tablets, which are believed to play an important role. This is also known as SANAM, or statin-associated necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. It should be emphasized that this is a rare condition and differs from toxic statin necrotizing myopathy that some patients can experience. Muscle biopsy is key in making the diagnosis with scattered necrosed fibers, but sparse inflammatory cells, which are mostly macrophages. There is a specific variation of necrotizing myopathy, which is associated with pipe stems capillaries on biopsy. These are associated with specific presentations, including strokes from associated brain vasculitis. Around 25% of patients with dermatomyositis have an underlying cancer, and this is around 10% in polymyositis and necrotizing myopathy. 
Those are often related to lung cancer in Western countries and nasopharyngeal cancers in Asian and African countries. Hence, it's important to screen patients for underlying cancers, particularly in the first year where they present most frequently, and then regularly in the subsequent five years if they haven't. Apart from the clinical history and, of course, muscle biopsies, there are a number of other tests that are very useful in making the diagnosis. These include a variety of blood tests, the most basic of which are looking for a raised creatine kinase, also known more frequently in the USA as creatine phosphokinase. This is an enzyme that can be released by degenerated muscle tissues and tends to be referred to as the CK or CPK for short. Other enzymes and markers of inflammation should also be checked as well as the known myositis-specific autoantibodies. Neurophysiologists such as myself can be helpful in identifying myopathic signals using electromyography. You can see a video explaining the pertinent changes by clicking on the iCard above. MRI of the muscles is also a useful tool, especially looking for increased water content in the muscles, which is an important marker of these conditions. Apart from the myositis, other tissue groups can become involved as well. There can be inflammation of the lungs called interstitial lung disease or ILD. The heart can also become involved as well as more generalized inflammation of blood vessels, such as in the gut. It can also be associated with inflammation of the joints and may be associated with the presence of other autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes or SLE. Therefore, these all need to be checked for and monitored. As always, there are three components to treatment. Number one, tackling the underlying cause of the disease. Number two, managing associated complications or conditions. And number three, treating symptoms and improving function. For any individual, the potential benefits and side effects of any treatment have to be weighed up by the treating physician in consultation with their patient in their clinical context. So the following comments are intended as a broad overview. Treating the underlying cause means either suppressing or modulating the immune system. There are a number of ways to do this, but the most common way is using corticosteroids such as prednisone. These are started at a high dose for a number of weeks and then are tapered down according to disease severity and response. There are a number of different ways it can be prescribed to try and reduce potential side effects. Improvement in strength often takes a number of months and in more severe cases the steroids might be started intravenously. If there isn't a good response after a couple of months then consideration of additional second line therapies such as azathioprine or methotrexate are possible. These might be started earlier in patients who are less likely to tolerate steroids such as those with diabetes or hypertension. More specialized treatments such as intravenous immunoglobulins, mycophenolate mofetil, rituximab, cyclophosphamide may be necessary if other options are insufficient or poorly tolerated. There are a number of fourth-line agents which have been trialed as well in small numbers for very refractory cases. It would be fair to say that it is becoming increasingly recognized as necessary and in line with similar conditions that there should be patient-specific treatments. This will hopefully evolve with our ever-increasing understanding of these conditions, better identification of disease biomarkers, and a stronger evidence base for treatment in the individual conditions. You can see a link to the latest Cochrane review in the information box below. Management of complications and associated other conditions is very, very important and may require input from a range of allied specialties such as the respiratory physicians, cardiologists, gastroenterologists and pain specialists. Physiotherapy and occupational therapy input is also clearly of great importance in maximising function. Exercise has also been shown to have positive effects against these conditions as well. Thus a multidisciplinary and integrated approach is really important in these conditions. I hope that you have found this video useful and if so please support this channel by subscribing and giving a thumbs up. Thank you.